Welcome to the second example in the chapter of torsion. The question reads, the 60mm diameter solid shaft is subjected to the distributed and concentrated torsional loadings shown in the figure below. Determine the shear stress at points A and B and sketch the shear stress on volume elements located at these points. Okay, so I guess the only thing worth writing down in this case is the diameter of the shaft, right? And the diameter of the shaft in this case is 60 millimeters. We can move on to unknowns. And for unknowns, it simply wants us to find the shear stress, the shear stress at this section A and at this section B. Um, and more specifically, uh, it later wants us to, um, to sketch like a volume element at this point A and at this point B, right? So we can do that. So we want to find tau A, we want to find tau B. Refresher uh, formula for shear stress due to torsional loads is equal to Tc over J, where T represents the torque at um, the torque where you're trying to find the shear stress. C represents, in this case, just the radius, right? Since it's a solid, um, solid shaft. So we can write R, which is equal to 30 mm. Uh, the polar moment of inertia, in this case, for a circular solid shaft, is equal to pi over 2 R to the fourth power. And yeah, I think we can start cutting our sections and then finding the shear stress. So fairly, fairly straightforward question. So three, uh, we want to find shear stress at, it's horrible, at, 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 <laughs> at A. So if we draw this lovely guy like this kind of, and we cut it at A, similar to the last question, or the exact same thing as the last question. We cut it like that. Um, we are going to have our torque right here of 400 newton meters. And we're going to have our reactionary torque, which we'll assume to be um, clockwise or counterclockwise, right? And we'll call this torque at A, right? So if we take the sum of torque... So positive is counterclockwise for this section. Um, we'll call this point, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll call this, I don't know, point C. So if we take the section CA is equal to zero, we have TA minus 400 newton meters is equal to zero. Therefore, my torque at this section that I'm cutting is equal to 400 newton meters, right? And from then I can easily find my shear stress using this formula. So my shear stress at point A is equal to the torque at point A, which I found to be 400 uh, newton meters. Please do not forget to convert this to millimeters, just multiply by 1000. Um, multiply by C, which in this case is um, 30 millimeters, right? 30 millimeters divided by um, pi over 2, 30 millimeters to the fourth power. And what you're going to end up getting is that your shear stress at point A is equal to a value of 9.43 megapascals. Do not forget to convert these units, please, and thank you. Yeah? Okay. Um, and that's the um, that's one of your first answers. We'll draw the volume elements at the end, um, but first we'll find tau um, at point B. Shear stress at point B. Right? Let's keep this in frame. If we draw this lovely guy again, it's going to be a bit longer this time. We cut it at point B. Obviously, we have our 400 newton meter torque that's acting clockwise. Uh, what else do we have here? If you look, this is a um, this is a 600 newton. Right now, we don't really care about these dimensions. Once we get um, at angle of deformation, I think in the next example, um, we care about these dimensions. But we do care about these dimensions for a distributed load, right? So it's the exact same concept as normal distributed load like you, you'd have with forces before you just multiply by the amount of meters for example this is six kilonewton per meters and this is 
three meters, you just multiply by, um, you just multiply by three to get like a, a full value. So you get 18 kilonewton <clears throat> as like one um, representation of your distributed load, right? So it's the exact <clears throat> same concept here. So we're just multiplying this value, two kilonewton meters per meter by 0 0.4, right? And then that will give us uh, 800, I believe, 800 newton meters, right? So if we do that, we have a 600 newton meter um, torque right here. And then we have this distributed load. We're only looking at this portion right here. And that is if I convert um, two kilonewtons to actual newtons. So I have 2,000 newton meters per meter multiplied by the length this distributed load is acting on, which in this case is 0 0.4 meters. So that will give me 800 newton meters acting at the center right if i it doesn't matter in this case but if i did want to know where it acts it acts right um in the middle right so it acts at 0 0.2 this distance right here right but for this question we don't really care so i can write that down just a simple distributed load and then again we have our reactionary torque We'll call this TB. And now I take some of torques to find TB. And we say this section is CB is equal to zero. So I have negative 400 plus 600 minus 800 plus TB. Once I isolate for TB, I'm going to get a value of 600 newton meters. Right. And now I can easily plug this in to my shear stress formula to find the shear stress at um, my section B. Multiplied by the exact same values from last time. 30 millimeters divided by pi over 2, 30 millimeters to the power of 4. Please convert that, right? And what you're going to end up getting is a value of 14.15 megapascals, right? So these are your two shear stress values. Um, the last thing the question wants us to find is um, the shear stress, the shear stress is sketched on a volume element, right? So we can write this as our step five and we can say volume elements volume elements and we can say a we can say b right okay so the only difference basically is that a is at the top and b is at the side right and if we uh, look back, TA is acting clockwise, uh, counterclockwise. TB is also acting counterclockwise. Remember, if we got a negative answer, then that would have meant that it actually acts clockwise, but we didn't. So both of them act counterclockwise. So therefore, at A, we're going to have our shear stress or our, our, our torque acting like that. And then our torque is also going to act like that, right? So how that looks, and since we have like a circular cross section, how that's going to look is we're going to assume that our shear stress, like it, it um, is distributed linearly. So if I draw a section, for example, this is um, for A, right? My point A is right here, right? This is my center axis, and my torque is acting like this, right? We said clockwise. This is TA. My shear stress is going gonna, is gonna to distribute linearly, right? So what does that mean? Well, that means that I'm going to have a linear function like that. And then this is my shear stress. This is what it's going to look like, right? So the more I, I go towards my diameter uh, radially from my axis, the more my shear stress is going to be. And this is where my, my maximum shear stress is going to be. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if you twist something, the center is not going to feel it that much, but the end is, right? So hopefully that analogy made sense. It made sense for me. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's how it works. Um, so we can draw that right here. If 
this is the center. This is our point A. So our shear stress is going to be a linear function, kind of, like that. And this is due to our torque that's acting clockwise, or counterclockwise, my bad. TA. The exact same thing for, for B, but in this case, we're just going to look on the side. And remember, this acts linearly. Like that, that doesn't mean that this is the only place where the shear stress acts. It also acts here, right? It's also here. It's, it's, it's throughout the circle, right? But we're, we are, we're just focusing on this part, right? Um, and why is that? So when we do draw our volume element, draw it nice and big. Amazing. Now it's gonna look kinda gonna look like that. We know that the shear stress at A is acting like kind of horizontal, right? So I can draw my vectors like so. If I'm looking at this face, it's gonna act like this. Right? If I'm looking at this face, or let's look at the back face first, it's going to act in the opposite direction. Right? And then I need to balance it out. So let's just draw that. It's going to look like that. And on the back face, it's going to be the opposite direction. But remember, everything's static, so I need to balance it out. Right? So it's going to look like that. And then like that on these respective faces. Right? So it all works out. And this is for point A. Point B, since it's located here, it's going to be mainly the exact same thing. But instead, we're going to look at these faces, right? So if I draw the circle again once more, it's kind of going to look like this. This is my point B, right? Remember my torque B? Is acting counterclockwise right and then my volume element is going to look basically the same thing just erase these but this time they're going to my vectors are going to be vertical right So they're going to look like that on this face, the opposite direction on the, the, the parallel face, and then obviously nothing's moving, so I have to balance it out. Because if I just kept it like this, then obviously it would actually rotate, right? About this axis, if you visualize it. About this axis, wouldn't it rotate like this? If I just had these forces acting, yeah, it would. So I have to balance it out with um, two other vectors since nothing's moving, right? On these respective faces... Maybe that was just confusing. So on the top face, the bottom face, <clears throat> and the left and right faces. And yeah, uh, these are your volume elements. This is your shear stress value at um, section B. This is your shear stress value at section A or point A. And yeah, these are your answers to this question.